to the tail of Moby Dick. Bob Johnson. Call me Ishmael. That is the first line of the American classic Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Is this the fictional story of the hunt for a killer white whale? Or as some literary academics put it, the inner conflict of man as he chooses between good and evil, blah, 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 blah. Why ruin a good story? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the story of Moby Dick, but I will tell you of some of the events that led up to the penning of this novel. Herman Melville, as a young man, actually worked aboard a whaling ship. There he met experienced whalers from all over the world. They later became characters in his novel. He also heard of other whaling ships and different experiences at the sea. <clears throat> Thus, Moby Dick was born in 1850 from a compilation of these stories. The whaling industry actually began in 1650. As whales were spotted from the shore, men would get into the boats and row out to the whales for the hunt. Soon, larger ships with full crews were combing the seas from South Africa to South America to the Tahitian Islands in search of these great creatures. The whaling industry was in full boom in 1850 with the unofficial capital being New Bedford, Massachusetts. During this time, it got harder and harder to find whales. Could it be these intelligent mammals had the sense that they were prey and they were trying to avoid their hunters and their sharp harpoons? What about the so-called attacks on whaling ships? Could this have just been a misinterpreted response by the whales to the banging and the clanging of the blacksmith as they worked all night on board these vessels? Or was this a malicious, flooding attack by an enraged, full whale just trying to survive. Scientists, scholars, sailors, and Herman Melville ask these questions. The true life story of the Essex, a whaling ship from the 1820s, is probably what most inspired Moby Dick. The Essex left New Bedford in 1829 for a two and a half year journey Captain George Pollard led the ship, and under his command was first mate Owen Chase and a crew of 18, including Captain Pollard's young teenage cousin, Owen Coffin. It didn't take long after they left port when they ran into trouble. After two days at sea, the 87-foot ship ran into a squall and nearly sank. It took five weeks to get to South Africa, to the whaling grounds. Upon arrival, they found it about fished out. So they headed to the Galapagos Islands to restock. There, they were able to load 60 100-pound turtles on board. But one of the crew decided he was going to play a practical joke, started a little fire. Soon that got out of control and scorched the entire island, and is believed to cause the extinction of two different species. During the next year, the Essex had great whaling. They were just loading the hull up with oil. And soon, the Essex found itself a thousand miles from land. During this period, Captain Pollard decided he was going to take one of the smaller whaling boats and a small crew and go out on hunt and leave first mate Chase on board. While on board the Essex, Owen Chase spotted a large whale, 85 feet long, headed straight for the ship. Pow! 
He hit it head on, almost knocking the crew to the deck. They raced to make repairs as water started to pour in. The whale then submerged and was presumed to have left the area. Then, there he is again! This time, head half submerged, coming at great speed towards the ship. He hit her right in the bow. This time, water gushed in. The crew knew there was no saving the Essex. They lowered the remaining boats, loaded it with supplies and navigation lanes. From afar, Captain Pollard could see that the Essex was in peril. And when he got back, he was dumbfounded to find out what had happened. They divided the men among the three boats and set course for the nearest island as they watched the Essex sink. The crew, spooked by unfounded rumors of cannibalism on the island, convinced the captain to change course. So they went to an island that was further away. They finally made it to the island, only to find it near Barron. Three men decided they were going to take their chances and stay, while the others loaded up in two boats and set out. They were challenged by saltwater saturated supplies, dehydration, a raging sun, and being harassed by whales. After two months at sea, the rations were about depleted and taking a toll on the men. One man went mad, fell into convulsions, and died. Humanity would shudder at what happened next. They removed the limbs, stripped off the flesh, and they opened up the torso, removed the organs, sewed it back up as best they could, and interred the body to sea. During the next week, three more men died. Their flesh also became rations. After two weeks, the rations ran out. The crew decided to draw lots. Captain Pollard's young cousin drew the lot. Captain Pollard said he would shoot the first man who touched him. But the young sailor would have none of it. He laid his head down on the side of the boat, and the second lot pulled the trigger. Eighty-nine days later, after two months at sea, even though separated, the two boats were finally rescued. And the three men presumed dead on the island, they had also been rescued. Upon arrival to Nantucket, they were greeted mostly without judgment. You see, in those days, cannibalism, under the most dire circumstances, was a custom of the sea. That is everyone except for Captain Pollard. Because he had consumed his cousin, he was accused of gastric incest. He was shunned by many and never forgiven. Herman Melville met the man many years later. The once proud sea captain, now a lowly night watchman. The true tale of Moby Dick. To find out more about whaling and adventures on the sea, give it a read. Mr. Toastmaster.